As Q once said, all good things must come to an end, and sadly the great first season of Lower Decks has released its final episode. It's warp time. Godspeed, you crazy f Hello everyone, my name is Captain Jack and welcome to Trek Central. Episode 10 of Star Trek Lower Decks is titled No Small Parts, and it's all about Ensign Mariner dealing with the fact that the crew of the USS Ceratos now know that Captain Freeman is her mother. All thanks to Ensign Boimler, of course. The episode is written by series creator and showrunner Mike McCann, and directed by Barry J. Kelly, who has become a really great director, having directed a couple of the previous episodes, which were fantastic. Of course, if you're new around here, then make sure to hit that subscribe button to Trek Central to never miss a video from myself and the team. With Star Trek Lower Decks now out of the way, we are still continuing these 23 weeks of Trek content, with Discovery returning to our screens, so look forward to that coming next week on October 15th and 16th. Before we do get into today's video, New York Comic Con has just happened today. This video has obviously been recorded beforehand, so therefore I hope we get some good announcements. And if you want to see our reaction to the Star Trek Universe panels, we did a live stream covering it, which is available at 16.30 BST and your local times for that. Alright, let's get into today's review, but remember, spoiler warning. The episode starts out on Beta 3, a planet from the original series episode, The Return of Archons. What is great about this is that it's referenced in the episode via the mission logs. It actually shows an animated series Captain Kirk and Commander Spock. It turns out that people are worshipping a computer, one that apparently deems that people kill each other and eat each other. Yeah, a classic the original series episode. Now Commander Jack Ransom even says it's almost weird revisiting plants from the TOS era, with TOS referring to the 2260s. TOS apparently stands for Those Old Scientists, it seems. Kind of seems like they're just stumbling upon crazy new aliens every week. Yep, seems like I'm really going to enjoy this episode. Ensign Maron and Boimler are giving out art supplies for children on Beta 3, of course against the rules of the captain. Ensign Boimler accidentally leaks the info out that Maron is Captain Freeman's daughter, as his comm badge is still on, transmitting the whole thing to the bridge crew of the USS Cerritos. Meanwhile, in another sector of space, Captain Dayton from the USS Rubido from Episode 7 returns, now as captain of a brand new USS Solvang. The ship is so new that it still has plastic over its touchscreens, and the captain's asking all officers to take off their shoes. It's kind of like when you buy a new car or get a new flat, you don't want to take it off anything. As is the case of all California-class starships, the names of them are related to something close to the state of California. Solvang is actually a Dutch-themed town near Santa Barbara, in the San Yez Valley, actually very close to where Star Trek Picard filmed its Chateau Picard scenes. Before we know it, this crazy mismatch of a starship drops out of warp and starts to fire on the Solvang. Of course, the Solvang tries to go to warp as the enemy ship grapples itself onto the ships themselves, but it does blow up in the process. The ship style really reminds me of Uruban vessels that John Eves designed for the original Star Trek Online game. A ship made up of other species ships, which is a very cool concept and I'm surprising it's not been done in Star Trek before. And now we've come full circle. Just as Ensign Boimler was the liaison officer for Ensign Tendi in episode 1, Tendi is now the liaison officer for the new Exocomp officer. It's an amazing to see an Exocomp back in Star Trek, and they're definitely an interesting one. This one's name is Peanut Hamper, and they're very good at surgery, however extremely selfish as when they're needed later in the episode, they beam out instead of sacrificing themselves. I mean, I guess everyone carries an emergency transport these days? Apparently so. Ensign Mariner seems to have dated some real weirdos and one of her former dates is a Federation conspiracist, claiming that Wolf 359 was an inside job and that the changings aren't real, so the Dominion War didn't happen. Seems like we still have crazy conspiracy people all the way in the 24th century. Sometimes you can never get rid of things, it seems. While in Federation space, the USS Cerritos is told that a partial distress call from the USS Solvang has been received, and that even though the USS Titan is also in range, the Cerritos will deal with it due to the Captain Freeman's interactions with Captain Dayton. The competition between the two captains seems to be the other one trying to up the other one all the time. Then again, this appears frequently with captains of the Federation's California class it seems. Maybe it's just a thing about the ships looking the same. Mariner changes her attitude to get a promotion to transfer to the USS Sacramento, as now on board the Ceratos, everyone knows who she is as the captain's daughter, they're kinda treating her in a way that's kinda different, which won't allow her to do her Robin Hood style missions of being there for people even when the rules prohibit it. The Cerritos warps in to the USS Solvang's debris field and comes face to face with an enemy ship. The enemy ship is harvesting the wreckage of the Solvang, then we get a badass action scene as the enemy ship starts to fire on the USS Cerritos. 
Of course, they try to duck and run evasive maneuvers between the debris. The enemy ship does grapple onto them in a cell of the three turtles, but instead of going to warp, Freeman realizes that this is what Dayton would have done, so decides to power down. I really have to say, thinking of it on the spot shows what a good Captain Freeman actually is. She's not this run-of-the-mill captain, she's actually quite an experienced officer. Now of course, who is this random enemy that's attacking Federation starships? Why of course, it's the Packleds. Yep, the very same dumb enemy species that are actually quite cunning in Star Trek The Next Generation. Their ship is a mix-max of every starship component. It's composed of Bajoran, Klingon, Ferengi, and many others. As they're well known for faking distress signals, now I guess they're attacking those who arrive and stealing their ships, so they get ship parts. It also seems that Packlads think that every Federation ship they encounter is the USS Enterprise. I guess it kind of looks similar to a Galaxy class, though not so much. Now however, due to this mismatch of so many different ship systems, their ship code is completely open and trusting, therefore exposed to viruses. Which is how the Cerritos crew is going to deal with this enemy. However, to make such a fast acting virus in such a small amount of time, Rutherford is forced to activate Badgy to help him make the virus. And yes, you heard me right, Badgy is also back. While this is all going on on the Cerritos, the Packleds are going to board the ship, but the transporter system is extremely slow. So slow the bridge crew have time to evacuate the bridge and make it down a deck or two before any of them can actually materialise on the ship itself. You'd think they would have stolen a better transporter system, but hey, I'm not criticising. As the Packleds are beaming in, Ransom says the best line, setting fists to stun and my kicks to kill. Instead of a crew being massively unarmed as the Packleds arrive with their own weapons, Ensign Mariner has hidden weapons throughout the entire ship. One of the contraband items is a Spock helmet, we finally have a Spock helmet in canon, a weird toy from the original series which Star Trek fans regard as a meme of sorts. While this is all taking place on the Sweet Tolls, Lieutenant Shax and Ensign Rutherford team up to get the virus over to the enemy ship, as it needs to be inputted manually, I mean of course. Shax uses a shuttle which Rutherford and the Lower Deckers have been working on throughout the last season. The shuttle actually has an original series phaser sound it seems, and the shuttle is also called Suica, another national park in California, and has shark teeth and small paintings of the Lower Decks crew on the side. Hmm, interesting. Honestly, the action scenes in this episode alone have been amazing, while keeping with the style of Star Trek at what Lower Deck has set out to have its own visual continuity. I loved it. At some point the animation even looked more high definition than it usually does. I'm not sure that's just my eyes or the setting this episode, but I reckon a little bit more budget was spent around here. While on board the Packled mismatch ship, Ensign Rutherford tries to upload the virus, but it seems Badgy ported himself into the virus, of course, and won't activate it until he sees his creator die horrible to the Packleds. Of course, Lieutenant Shax deals with this and tears Rutherford's implant off, throws him into the shuttle and pushes it out of the ship, sacrificing himself as the Packled ship explodes into 101 bits. We will forever mourn the loss of a great Papa Bear of the Bear Pack, Lieutenant Shax. He is truly with the Prophets now and blowing up everything he wants with the Celestial Temple. However, it seems like Shax's sacrifice was in vain as more Packled ships arrive and immediately start grappling on to the Cerritos, each trying to pull it apart. You can tell from the bridge that they're trying to pull the ship apart because of the tensing sounds. I will say, Ensign Mariner does suit the captain's chair in a way. Very fun to see that, but as Captain Freeman reminds her to not get too comfortable. And then we get a ship that fans have wanted to see on our screens for so long. Yes, that is correct, the USS F***ing Titan appears and deals swift justice to all that enemy packled ships. Saving the USS Sweet Toes, as a TNG theme plays, the Titan is defeating Packler ships and doing it so badass. Of course, in typical William Riker style. Moving to the bridge of a Titan, we get to see Captain William T. Riker and Commander Deanna Troy on the bridge of a Titan, and they're actually voiced by Marina Sirtis and Jonathan Frakes. This is actually the best day of my life. Thank you, CBS and Mike McCann. I've wanted to see the Titan. For years now, many of us have wanted to see the USS Titan in action, to the point that fans have created the USS Titan's Lunar class design for the extended Star Trek lore. This episode of Lower Decks canonizes that design, a ship we've covered many times here on the channel before, so make sure to give those videos a watch, I'll leave some linked in the video description below. Rounding off this episode, we're back at a Federation Starbase, presumably Douglas Station. Ensign Rutherford has lost his memory, now I kinda wonder how this will be dealt with in Season 2, but it does have some sadness as he doesn't remember his friends. Though with Ensign Tendi around, I'm sure he'll learn everything back in half the time as well. The crew have a funeral service for Shaxx's sacrifice. I do wonder how they're going to replace him. I'd really love if we get a type Vox situation, whether we recruit Shaxx's twin brother or cousin for Season 2. 
I mean, the thought did just occur to me these days. What if Tuvok is doing right now? The USS Voyager has returned for the last couple of years, and the USS Sritos needs a good security officer. Commander Tuvok might be the man for the job. Ensign Mariner and Captain Freeman seem to be working together from now on. Even though Freeman has to follow the rules, she still sees the problems within Starfleet and respects that Mariner does what she can to help people. They do agree not to tell her dad, who is of course a Federation Admiral. It does seem Ensign Boyne was able to do in one season what Harry Kim was not able to do in seven. Get promoted. And it turns out that instead of being promoted and transferred to the USS Sacramento, Boyne has now been promoted to Lieutenant Junior Grade and is serving on the USS Titan under Captain William T. Riker. Lieutenant Boyne really seems to have come into his own, as his experiences on the Cerritos, such as his bad away mission on Togana 4, are now serving him well, especially as he references the planet to his new shipmates, talking about a little Klingon Conley found on the planet. Hmm, I wonder how this will go this time around. Closing out the Season 1 final of Star Trek Lower Decks, William Riker walks under the bridge of the USS Titan, which I must say is really sexy. Riker comes in late having watched the coup of the NX Enterprise again. It really has been a long road getting from here and there. You know I enjoyed saying that. And finally, in true William T. Riker fashion, Freeman may have taken a while finding her warp catchphrase, but Riker has just been able to incorporate jazz into his with a give me a warp in a factor of 5, 6, 7, 8 over jazz. My final thoughts on this episode is that it served as probably one of the best season final episodes that could ever have been. It had references and tie-ins to numerous episodes throughout this first season, and did a hell of a good job of making that possible. From Captain Dayton of the USS Rubido in episode 7, to references to Togana 4 from the very second episode. It had high stakes and high action, to some very high emotional moments with the death of Shax. I do not know how Dom is going to cope, as Shax was his favourite character, to the point where we've even ordered a Shax standee from the Star Trek web store. Look forward to that in live streams very soon. You know, it's kind of clever that the villain of this episode was the Packleds, who are not the most smartest species around, who still served as quite a great cunning villain for this episode. I'm not sure if that's a jab at the US of Sweetos, or just that the Federation underestimated the Packleds. But as Ensign Mariner says towards the end of this episode, the Federation is very good at observing, just not maintaining. And it's really good that these characters can see the Federation isn't 100% perfect, and this show has really shown off in an excellent way. I am sure we'll be doing a first season review of Star Trek Lower Decks, and we'll have a look at that then. Cast and continuity wise, not only is this the first episode of the entire franchise to canonize the term TOS, but also marks Jonathan Frakes as the only regular cast member to appear in six different Star Trek television series. We all remember Enterprise series final, and so does Frakes apparently, remarking on in a recent interview with SFX magazine. We'll have news on that soon. Finally, I have to note on the fact that the music and animation of this episode was spectacular. Not only did we get our great Next Generation theme as the Titan warped in, but all the space animation was superb and really well executed. I will always be astounded by the animation in this show, and this episode surpassed what we've seen so far. Going into Season 2, there is only even greater room to become a truly great Trek series, that we remembered amongst all the great shows we've gotten. So far, Star Trek Lower Deck still serves as a love letter to not only the next generation, but also the Star Trek franchise as a whole. I tip my hat to Mike McCann and the creative team behind Lower Decks, you have really created one fantastic Star Trek series. Now that does wrap us up on this entire first season of Star Trek Lower Decks. We'll be discussing this episode, this season, and what we can look forward to next season during our weekly live stream, every Sunday at 9pm BST. So tune in this week to join our live discussion about everything Lower Decks. I hope to see you there. Of course, we'll also be speculating about the season 2 of Lower Decks, which has been confirmed for a while now. Keep in mind that we'll have plenty of time to talk about that, so if you have any theories of your own, let us know in the comments section below. For now, I've been Captain Jack here on Trek Central, and we'll catch you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends.